So for, um, for the fourth lecture, chapter 14, I want to extend our understanding of the relationship between um, chemical reaction, the rate constant, and we're going to fold in to that a concept of, of temperature there. So, you know, the, um, the main thing to remember, I'll, we'll, we'll see this here in a second, so let me just sort of quickly talk about it here. You know, we've talked about concentration affecting the, the rate of the reaction. Um, we've hinted at the temperature affecting the rate of the reaction. The way we've done that is that really uh, all of these that we've discussed up to this point, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think we did any kind of exception to this statement, but it was a, it was a constant um, uh, t temperature. There was some value that was held constant and then you measured the, you followed the reaction of the the, 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 or the, the change in the concentration of the reaction and you were able to acquire the rate constant, the rate law, etc. Well now what we're going to do is we're going to vary the temperature and see how that affects the, the particular reaction. And so if we um, look back at our uh, hydrolysis reaction, this is a chemical reaction coming from organic chemistry. It's one that I've used uh, a, a, a couple presentations ago. Um, you can see that Remember what the reaction, what happens is that the, the chlorine gets replaced by an OH as the, the water comes along and, and reacts with this hydrolysis reaction. That's what we see here. And I'm actually going to, in the last talk, the next lecture for this chapter, we're going to come back to the hydrolysis reaction. That's one reason why I put it in here. Now, this, this raw data that we have here, you know, we looked at some ways to manipulate the raw data. That's true. Um, the the way we're going to view it here is that the, the steepness of that uh, exponential decay, because this is a first order reaction. First order reactions do follow what's called an exponential decay uh, for the 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 rate here. And and so this was was at, at some temperature t probably. Actually, you, you can get away with this particular reaction close to room temperature, really. I will just say uh, 30 degrees Celsius or so. So this reaction was recorded over a certain period of time at 30 degrees Celsius. Now, if, if I increase the temperature here, what's going to happen is actually um, I'm going to get a, a more rapid uh, decrease in the, uh, the or the, a rapid increase in the product formation is the way I guess I should say it if we're thinking about this process as a forward direction. So you increase the temperature and then, and then what happens is our, our, our rate increases. But, you know, in the context of this one, I mean, we're, we're holding the concentration the same, so it's suggesting that, that there's, a, there's actually a relationship that we're going to see uh, where, if we look at the rate law, it's actually this guy that varies with, with temperature. So, so when, when the rate constant here uh, is affected by the temperature, that's, that's why we see that, that sharper decrease or, or more rapid product formation in one of these reactions. And so, you know, previously, all the other talks, that's why we had to emphasize the fact that the temperature is held constant over and over again. Because in this particular uh, talk, in this particular section of the book, well, we learn that, that K starts to vary with the, the temperature, and that's important. And we can actually gain a, we can start gaining um, even more information about the mechanism, about the complexity of the reaction. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go through the, the next little bit. We're really going to start understanding how the molecules are colliding, what's controlling the reaction on a molecular level, which is, which is something that we haven't necessarily um, discussed in any great detail. I'll put it that way. And, and actually, well, this is a very simple experiment. Uh, you take one of those, uh, you know, these, these glow sticks here, and this is a, a high temperature, room temperature, warm water bath, it doesn't matter. And then over here you can see the ice cubes in there, and it's clearly, yeah, it's clearly a, a visual change. Uh, the, you can see this very easily. There's a decrease in the uh, in the the rate of the the reaction, concentrations haven't changed inside of those two sticks. They're essentially equivalent, uh, and the only thing that's changing here is, is the temperature. 
And so there's a relationship between the temperature and the, the rate constant. And we would call that, and, and here is a, a plot here, just know that there's, so it was, uh, oh, it's that rearrangement reaction. Well, actually, I'll pull, yeah, I'll pull a graph from a previous uh, lecture here in a minute that you've seen before. You've actually seen this before. This is uh, showing the, uh, the uh, summarization reaction for um, the uh, methyl isocyanate going to uh, acetonitrile here. And, and this reaction was run at now four different temperatures. So this is, this is the first time that we've seen an example where the, the temperature is, is varying, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and if we look at the relationship, well, a nice term, this is a, a nonlinear rela relationship. You know, if it was linear, and uh, I'll go and mark it up. If it was linear, you would see something like that, you know. As you increase the temperature, then there would be a, a simple, um, uh, an equivalent bump up, if you will, of the, uh, of the rate constant. And, it, and the slope could vary here, but it would be a, a straight line. Well, that's not what we see here. What we see is that there's a, a, a substantial increase in the rate constant as we go up into the higher temperatures and that would you know you can essentially just assume that trend is going to extend as you go up to higher higher temperatures so it's it's a nonlinear relationship uh, there's a rapid uh, increase as you get to the higher and higher temperatures and so well what am i trying to say if it's a nonlinear relationship then the equation that describes this particular relationship cannot be this guy. That is a linear relationship. So it's something different than, than what we've seen up to this point. And it's actually an, an exponential relationship. And this is um, probably one of the first times that we've talked about it in here, maybe the first time. Uh, we've, we played around with that natural logs a little bit, um, not much with exponential, if at all. And, and this is what's referred to as the Arrhenius equation. Now, I'm not going to go into a historical perspective about how this equation originated. I'm just going to give it to you. I'm just going to show it to you and, and explain what, is, what are the different components that you see in the equation. And this is the equation that we're going to use for the rest of the section here. Okay? And, and also keep in mind, this is important, some of the mathematical tricks that I'll show you will be used again in chapters... Uh, well, chapter 20 and then also possibly 19. So uh, it's the use of the exponential and the natural log relationship that you're going to see when I, when I start manipulating this expression. So when we look at this um, expression, well, there is the, the, the e raised to the something. That's, a, that's an exponential relationship or exponential uh, function. And all it is, well, the, what it looks like graphically is somewhere there's a there's a steep ascent or I guess you could also say a steep descent here you know there's a, a very rapid transition it's a nonlinear relationship now mathematicians have a more uh, more exact more technical term for the exponential and uh, it, it's it goes along with uh, the uh, the the change of the line is dependent upon the concentration or the particular function you're looking at um, I'm not a mathematician, so I don't quite have the language that, that they do. Um, for us, ah, noticing that steep change is what's important. Okay, it's a nonlinear relationship. What what are the components here? Well, let me put those we've already seen. Okay, this is the the rate constant, just like we saw. Uh, let's see, it's uh, this guy here. It's just our regular rate constant. Okay, that's where. Uh, you know, the, in this case, it's the, the y data that you see uh, plotted on, on this graph. So it's something we, we've seen before. Temperature, we know what that is. And this, just a reminder, this is the gas law, um, or the, the gas constant from the, the gas law chapter, chapter uh, uh, 10 in Brownell and May. The value that we use for this semester is uh, 3.14 joules per Kelvin mole. So it's, it's a, a variation. If you look at chapter 10, there's a little table in there that shows all the possible, vari well, not all the possible variations, but the majority of the variations for the gas law 
uh, is you change the units um, for um, those different components that make up the gas law, then, then you, you see the, the variation in the, the quantity for the thing. So for this chapter and all the rest, because we will come back to this in a few examples, quite a few examples in our last two chapters, or the next two chapters, uh, it's this gas law uh, value that we're going to be using. And these units are important because, you know, units are always important. They need to cancel out properly when you do a calculation. So it's a, a, actually a helpful way to keep track of whether the reaction or whether your calculation is working or not. Now the two other expressions that we have here, well, let's see, we have E, and we'll look at, we'll, we'll go through a sort of a graphical, uh, conceptual uh, representation of what does this mean. I'm just going to define it here. It's our activation energy. It's essentially how much energy does the molecule need to acquire to to get over the uh, the energy bear, and we'll we'll take a look at here in a second. Uh, this guy here is made up of uh, two different issues. The uh, the collision uh, the, the term is collision frequency. Or I think our book uses the uh, the frequency factor for this thing. Let me go and put it up here. All it's saying is that when when molecules react, they don't they don't react by themselves. I mean, well, if it's in a, like a bimolecular reaction where two things come together, you got to have the the proper orientation of the molecules, and you have to have a certain number of uh, collisions per second. Let's say a, a collision frequency. And so those are the, the, the uh, this issue of they, they must collide and they must have the proper orientation is sort of wrapped up into the, uh, the, the frequency factor. Uh, tell you the truth, it's the activation energy that we're really going to be focusing on uh, for the most part here. But let's just go through a couple little graphical representations here just to um, illustrate what's happening. Again, there's our, our two factors that are coming out of the Arrhenius equation. And notice, you know, we are just, we're, when, we, when we talk about the Arrhenius reaction and these two parameters that we obtain from the Arrhenius reaction, or equation, sorry, um, we are, we're, we're really digging into the uh, mechanics of the, of the reaction. We're, we're digging into the uh, sort of the guts of what's happening here. We're starting to get a glimpse of of, of how these molecules, you know, how the molecules rearrange themselves, how do they collide, how often do they collide, that kind of information. So um, it's, a, it's a building block for, well, honestly, if you take organic chemistry, you'll, you'll see these kind of, uh, uh, this issue of reaction mechanism much more in, in detail. And so having a, a little intro here for the concept can be very helpful for that particular uh, course. Um, now, the reason why I pulled this graph out is, well, it's, it's one we've seen before, uh, and I just want to point out a couple of things that I didn't point out before. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with going back to the same picture over and over again and, and pointing out new pieces of the puzzle uh, from that uh, picture. And the, the two that I want to discuss are, are those two. Uh, this is the, the activation energy, and this is essentially a, a energy a barrier that the molecule must overcome or the molecules must overcome to be able to get to the to the product side. Oops, so P, that's the product over there. And then the, the change in E, well this is telling you whether it's an endothermic reaction or an exothermic reaction. And, and that's a big deal uh, when we start talking about in the next chapter uh, what is controlling a chemical reaction. Um, early on in, in chemistry I'm thinking of the, the 19th century here. Uh, many scientists felt that it was all exothermic reactions were the ones that were uh, spontaneous, and we quickly found out that that's not the case. There's endothermic reactions that are that are spontaneous as well, and and what that did is it, it really opened up a can of worms in terms of you know what is the actual equation, what is the other parameter that we have to factor in. So that's chapter 19 in a nutshell, pretty much. And so, so here, being able to look at these uh, graphs and know what am I looking at is, can be very useful for the, the next chapter. And again, uh, organic chemistry, if you, if you choose to or need to take that. In this particular example, this, 
a solmerization reaction that we're, sh we're showing. This is an exothermic reaction. The, the products are lower in energy than the, than the reactant, so there's been a release of energy. And I'll, I'm just going to go ahead and say release of heat. Okay, um, the, the, the y-axis isn't exactly saying enthalpy, but, but I'm just going to use that term just to sort of get you in, in the mind, because that's usually a chemical reaction. That, that's, I mean, that's what we think of. In, in chapter 19, we'll, we'll put a finer edge on it. So, but, but right now, let's we'll, we'll just think about the heat released or absorbed. Um, in, the, in the next, the last presentation for this chapter, we'll, we'll look at these in more detail. So I just want to give you a quick little overview of, of uh, this kind of graph. And, and that's, um, that's, in a nutshell, the, the energy um, issues for a reaction. And then, you know, a, a reaction by itself isn't really going to do anything. It needs some, I mean, it may rearrange somehow, but, um, you know, typically there's more than one thing comes along and, and comes together to form a product. So this issue of collision becomes uh, a factor. If, if two things uh, are going to react together, they have to first meet before they can react. And it's not just, if we look at this bottom slide here, this is a, 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 an in a, what, ineffective collision. What that means is that you know, when the two molecules collide, they're just not aligned properly. And this, even though they're making contact with another, there, there's, there's, no, there's no reaction after the, the collision. Whereas if they make the proper orientation and they make a collision there, there, there we see, we see products now. And so th there's, there's this component of, again, this proper orientation that the reaction must, uh, or the reactants must acquire, and then also the, uh, there's a certain number of collisions per second, let's say, that has to take place before any substantial reaction is observed. So that's what is sort of woven into that, that A term. Okay? But again, we, we, we'll, we'll dig more into this idea of, of the activation energy. And just a simple little analogy, this is brought from the, from the book. You know the the golfer she she needs to hit <laughs> she needs to hit the golf ball a certain velocity to make it over the the bump here to get it in onto the the green and so you know th this can be represented as that 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 energy barrier the activation energy that must be acquired through the swing of the uh, golf club to make it over the the bump you know if, if this hill was was bigger then she'd have to uh, strike the ball uh, uh, harder to get it over. So it's just a, just a simple uh, analogy that, that I, when I saw it, I thought, well, that, that works pretty well for, for the energy uh, or the activation energy. Now, there, there's always this battle between concept and mathematics, so we can't get around it. Notice this new equation here for the Arrhenius reaction. Now, I'm actually going to, uh, let me put in its proper place. I'm actually going to uh, show the, the mathematics here because it's, um, it's something we're going to have to do a, a few times. So you need to sort of get comfortable with the use of the exponential form and the, uh, the use of the natural log in uh, conjunction with the exponential in a, in a formula like this. Um, so just let me start rearranging this so you can see how that... Um, uh, this equation, this equation, uh, no, went too far. This equation here is is developed from the original Arrhenius equation that we we started with, and so I'm going to simplify this guy. Start moving things around. Remember, this is referred to the exponential um, function. You know, if you look at if you look at your 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 calculator. Exponential button and the natural log button are the same buttons. Just and on my Cas Casio, I have the uh, EX as what's labeled on the button, and then the shift key would acquire the the natural log. So there's a relationship between the two. It it's, goes back and forth, just like log and then raising some number to the power some ten to some number. That's the log base ten. There's a relationship between these two, and so we use that in this particular uh, problem because we need to get rid of the the exponential 
Now, the reason why we're rearranging this expression here, well, it's, it's just easier to work with once we do that. Let me put it that way. We can do more with it once we've rearranged it. And, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. And what happens here, when I do that, well, this, I definitely have a new expression. And I have one over here, but I'm, I've actually simplified this expression. When you take the natural log of an exponential, well, you essentially cancel the exponential out. And you're left with, well, whatever was uh, in the, uh, the uh, exponent position. So, E A R T. You, you bring it down into a normal expression. Now, what's happened here, natural log of, of rate constant divided by the, frequ the, the frequency factor, well, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and arrange, rearrange it just a little bit using, not that way. K minus natural log of a. So if if you have a uh, two expressions um, in a in a d d division um, um, expression, then then the the natural log or log for that matter can be broken down in in this way where you're taking the the negative of the two expressions. And then what I do here, when I rearrange it, is I just add natural log of a to both sides, and that will give me the expression that you see on the next page. Plus natural log of a. Now notice here, I, I, well, I guess not the whole thing, but this guy mainly, it is, it is written a little bit differently on the next page. So just notice that I've grouped them all together in the same expression in the uh, the one on the next page what I've done is I've separated out 1 over t by itself because because that's the the x this guy here and so the slope is given by activation energy divided by t why is this useful well oh and then I guess if we want to get the frequency factor then then we, we can look at the y-intercept for the data well, this is our equation of a line. We've, we've used this thing before, so we should be at least a little comfortable, hopefully, with this thing. Um, you will have to do these kind of plots, so just be aware. Um, if when you're working on the homework and the quizzes, you're going to see it. Um, so so just, just look alive. What do we have here? Well, we have, we, have, we have quantitative data. We have temperature. That's something easily measured in a chemical reaction. And I would just note, you, you can look at... Uh, Exercise 1411 for the complete story for this reaction. And there's another table showing the raw data. But, you know, essentially what we have, two bits of empirical data. We have the, the temperature that we can acquire very easily. And then the K, we've already learned how to calculate the K from the two previous uh, presentations. And so this is empirical data. So the, you, you would have a, a, a tabulated data of, of K and T. Because remember, K varies with T, and we can see it. Uh, remember this this graph that we saw a few minutes ago? K versus T is that nonlinear relationship, four different temperatures for this, this rate constant. So rate constant varies with temperature, and they've just taken the natural log of the rate constant and, and obtained this value here. What's, what's the purpose? Well, the Arrhenius equation, the way we've rearranged it here, the form of a straight line, if we plot you know, uh, natural log of k versus the inverse of t, which, what do you know, is showing up on the graph here. If we know the slope, and we can acquire the slope from any of these graphs, whether graphically or mathematically, using our calculator or using some uh, program such as Excel, or I've also uh, giving you the uh, the particular website that that goes through uh, or allows this uh, type of calculation as well. So numerically, m the slope is equal to 1.9 times 10 to the 4 uh, Kelvin. Now, mathematically, you know, or as an equation, what does it look like? Well, that m the slope is equal to the activation the activation energy, which is what we're wanting. And then some constant that we already know. Remember, 8.314 is the value for R for these chapters, and so, or for this this core, this particular uh, semester. And, and if we solve for the activation energy, well, that's simply the 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 negative of the slope times the the rate constant. 
if I plug these values in, and I got a, there's two negatives here. There's a negative from the slope, and then there's a negative from our original expression up here. We still got to keep this guy when we when we do the uh, the, the calculation here. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to work. And then this R is 8.314. Running out of room, but it's it's joules per Kelvin mole. Kelvin is going to cancel out because the unit's in the, the slope. And I'm left with a, uh, a rate constant, I'm sorry, activation energy of 1 times 6 times 10 to the 5. That's a, you know, a decent-sized uh, energy barrier for molecules to get across. And the book, what the book is doing is it, it converts this to kilojoules per mole, which is typical for, for a lot of these uh, problems. If, if you have you know, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 or larger, typically you, you switch it over to kilojoules per mole. So just appreciate what we've done. We've been able to um, uh, take the um, empirical data, rate constant temperature. It's a nonlinear relationship. It's an exponential relationship. And using this new form of the Arrhenius reaction, we've we've quantitated this this um, this sort of abstract notion of what what do the molecules have to overcome to make it over to the product side or get toward the product side, depending on how many steps in the reaction you have in front of you. So, you know, empirical data uh, that can be used to acquire um, direct mechanistic data is, is very useful. And that's one form of the Arrhenius reaction that we're going to use. The other one is uh, this guy here. And uh, what we've done, the, the book shows this example, how it acquires this particular uh, expression. Let me talk about it just a little bit. Notice this, oh well, this, the, the two up here, this guy and this guy, they, they are the same expression that I just finished using. Uh, it's, it's this guy. It's the one that I derived for you uh, in this presentation. And, and the, 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 the K and the T, well, they were unique to uh, two values, uh, two pieces of empirical data that were given to you in the problem or you would have inquire, acquired in lab. Um, uh, R uh, is, a, is a constant and then uh, but if we knew the, uh, uh, the, the, different, the, the activation energy or, or the frequency factor from one of these plots then what we can do is we can use this new form of the Arrhenius reaction. But I, I guess the main thing to appreciate is that you know, one expression per temperature and rate constant pairings up. And that's what you have here. You see the, the sub 1 and the sub 1 here, sub 2 and sub 2. And so, you know, all we're saying is that um, th this calculation would be for one set of data and this calculation would be for a second set of data. And th the thing about it is we let the, the natural log of A be the same in both expressions and what it does we can let's say solve for natural log of A in one plug it into this expression rearrange the expression and now we get the more complicated one I'm not going through the algebra here because it's not needed and it's it's sort of long and drawn out it's um, it's it's complex but it doesn't use necessarily some advanced like trig identity you know something like that uh, so if I went through it, it just burned time. It wouldn't really illustrate anything new, so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to give you the expression that you'll have to use on the the quizzes and the and the test and the homeworks. Um, and and how can we use it? Well, you know this this data here. And this is the same table from before. And let me just sort of show you the range of of of. Uh, oh, this is degrees Celsius here going up to about what, 251 degrees Celsius is what I calculated for, for that guy. Um, and look at what the problem is asking. It wants to know the, the rate constant. So it's actually curious about K. That's the unknown in this particular uh, problem. At 280 degrees Celsius, it's above this guy. 
So remember, it's, it's a nonlinear relationship. So uh, as we uh, increase in temperature, there's a, 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 a larger and larger change in the, the rate constant. And so that's what we're going to see in, in this calculation here. So, we, you know, we have this parameter, and we want to know K. We want to know the other piece of empirical data that well, we've been using uh, for that last problem. This example can do that. So we let, uh, all, we, all we have to do really is um, we choose a, uh, let's see, what I've done for this problem is T1, I've given that, I've given T1 the, uh, the 280 degrees Celsius, and you've got to convert that to Kelvin, please. And then the, that means K1 would be the unknown. K1 would be this answer for the problem that they're, they're wondering about. And, and then what about T2 and T2 and K2? Well, that can be any two sets of data up here. Uh, actually, um, uh, yeah, what I did, T2, I'll let that be the, uh, the 189 degrees Celsius, or I'll go ahead and put it in the uh, 462.9 Kelvin, because you've got to use Kelvin. You can't use Celsius. Um, and then the K, actually, I would have to take, to convert that data point <laughs> to K2 uh, requires taking the, uh, well, the exponential of this value. And, and uh, it's, it's worth practicing. Make sure you can do that in your calculator. Otherwise, you're going to have some, some troubles. You know, it's, it's, practice on your calculator. If it's something new, you know, if you're uncertain, do it now. Make sure you can do it. Uh, otherwise, it's going to cause you a lot of headaches because I, I don't want you to, you know, struggling with material, that, that's just sort of part of the game, and you learn from that. Um, struggling with how to handle your calculator, that can be frustrating, and that can, I don't want that to limit your, your learning experience, okay? So, so make sure that you can take this value, take the exponential of that value on your calculator, and see that you get a number like this, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5. If it's 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the plus 3, something's wrong. Um, so make sure you can do this, this conversion here. Because this is the data that you would plug into the expression. And just FYI, if you look at the sample exercise uh, 1411 in your book, there's a table of all these data points. So um, you can practice with the other three if you want to, which, I mean, if you're having trouble here, you might want to do that with the other ones. Just to confirm, you can do it. Now, at this point, really, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the uh, activation energy that I calculated from the first example. So a lot of these types of problems can be paired up. You have the, the first problem where you're using the, the graphical method to figure out the activation energy here. And then you're using this new equation to then calculate a new rate constant for some other temperature that's not on your data list. You know, 280 is not on the original data list that you started with. Now, the use of this equation, there's a lot of numbers being thrown around. There's a lot of plugging and chugging on calculators. So again, uh, please practice with this. I'm going to go ahead and set this thing up to, to show you what it looks like uh, and just... Uh, just watch. These numbers are the same ones that were on the previous page. Inverse seconds, I'm going to keep that with it. The uh, E raised to, oh, I'm sorry, not that yet. I'm jumping ahead of myself on the notes. Um, let me get rid of that. Activation energy, and this has to be in joules. Joules per mole because our rate or our R value, 8.314 joules per Kelvin mole. 1 over T2, that is 462.9 Kelvin minus. Just made it. Minus 553 Kelvin. <clears throat> I 
All of that is equal to 6.77. Please practice that calculation because you got you got a mixture of you know inverse temperatures here that you subtract from one another, then you multiply that by uh, a problem involving division. There's a lot of steps in the, with plugging and chugging. I don't want the plugging and chugging to be the problem. I want I want I want your struggle to be with understanding this material and and figuring out and learning from it, not this thing. I'm just going to bring this down as is. Remember, natural log and exponential are related to one another. If I want to get rid of the, um, where was that? That was, yeah, right here. If I wanted to get rid of the exponential, I took the natural log. If I want to get rid of the natural log, I take the exponential of the entire expression. I have to do that to both sides. So exponential raised to 6.77. That numerically is 874.5. Uh, all, all these units cancel out, believe it or not. You're just left with inverse seconds. Solve for K1. So you're simply multiplying this value on both sides of the expression. So this value, actually, let me play high school for a minute. Let me, let me play simple algebra and what this looks like. You know, what, what did I do here? I wanted to simplify the expression. I wanted to get rid of the denominator. Well, that means I multiply both sides by the denominator. That cancels it out here. I'm left with K1 all by its lonesome. And now I have this, expre this mathematical expression, which is simple. It's a multiplication problem on this last step. Why did I go through all this? Well, th this notion of canceling out. Again, denominator, I want to get rid of it, so I multiply by both sides. What did I do up here? The natural log. I wanted to get rid of it, so I took the exponential of both sides. And so th there's a similarity in the algebraic methods. I'm trying to simplify. I'm trying to cancel one thing out. And to do that, I've got to do that mathematical operation to both sides. And then what we find is this value, it's, it's, it's larger than the others, 10 to the, the minus 2. Remember, as the temperature increases, uh, the rate constant increases more, is what it's saying. That's a nonlinear relationship. And so 10 to the minus 2, how does that fit in with this chart here? Um, oh, I don't have, I'm sorry. If you look at the chart on the, in the book, you see that it is the, the larger number than the ones that were there previously. Okay. That is the mathematical part of uh, reaction mechanisms that we have to deal with in this chapter. Uh, the, the last talk is uh, mostly conceptual. I don't know if there's much mathematics at all in that one, to tell you the truth. So um, just one more, and we'll be finished with, uh, with uh, chapter 14. Thanks.